Christianity is not a passive religion. I want you to listen to this. I find this very interesting. There are 1,542 references to the word go in the Bible. There are only 64 references to stay. So when your mind says, stay in bed all day, stay on the couch all day, that's when you can say, I don't think that's what God wants me to do. I think I'll get up and go do something for somebody. I'll go clean my closet. I'll go. Now, you know, I mean, there's days to plan to stay on the couch all day. We need that once in a while. But at least if you're going to do it, do it with a little bit of zeal and enthusiasm. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Just say, I'm laying on this couch. I'm enjoying it. Woo! I'm, praise God. All right, are you with me? Nothing dead praises God, and dead religion certainly doesn't praise God. <laughs> Most of the people that have judged and criticized me were pharisaical religious people who weren't doing anything. It's amazing how many people who don't do anything find fault with the way somebody who is doing something is doing it. The Bible teaches us in Romans 12, 11, that we are to be full of zeal, enthusiastic, and on fire. Can I tell you that God just seems to like fire? Matter of fact, the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. He appeared to Moses in a burning bush, not a stagnant pool of cold water. He followed the Israelites with a pillar of fire at night. Sacrifices had to be offered by fire. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell and tongues of fire settled on the people. Jeremiah said, his word is like fire shut up in my bones. Second Thessalonians, he will be revealed from heaven in a blazing fire. In Revelation, he's depicted as having eyes of fire. And I love this one. Psalm 97, 3. A fire goes before him and burns up all of his enemies. So here's what I have to say. Maybe if we had a little more fire, we'd have a lot less trouble with the devil. Come on, that's good. If we had a little more fire, maybe we'd have a lot less trouble with the enemy. And I know there's some of you thinking, oh, yippee skippy, I When's this going to be over, Mabel? Huh? <laughs> I have a problem. I know you're going to help me with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, I tell it so much it's embarrassing, really, but I have to tell it again. In John 5, the crippled man that lay by the pool 38 years, 38 years he's laying there waiting for an angel to come by, stick his finger in the water and make it bubble. And once a year, only once a year, whoever happened to get in the pool first got a miracle. <laughs> and Jesus came by and saw the man. And he said to him, trying to shock him into realization, the Amplified Bible says, how long have you been in this condition? So maybe I'm going to say that to you today. How long have you been in the same condition? How long have you been stuck in the same spot? How long have you been mourning over something that you lost that you're never going to get back, but that doesn't mean there's not something brand new? How long are you going to mourn over what your parents didn't give you or the education you didn't get or the opportunities you didn't have? How long are you going to be jealous of other people who have what you want, but maybe you don't have it because you weren't willing to do what they did to get it? I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> How 
How long have you been in that condition? 38 years. And here's what he said. I, this guy, you got to read it in John 5 verses 1 through 8. He said, well, every time I try to get into the pool, somebody else gets ahead of me. And I have nobody, I love this, I have nobody to put me into the pool. <laughs> Do you get it? And you know what Jesus said to him? And there's an exclamation mark in the Amplified Bible after it. So I'm assuming that he got a little emphatic. Jesus said, get up. And sometimes that's the best advice that somebody can give you. You're in the middle of a pity party for the ninth day in a row. Oh God, you got to help me, you got to help me. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, get up. Amen? Amen. Now obviously when we're talking about being full of enthusiasm and fire and zeal, we're not talking about just raw emotion. Just operating in emotion can get you in a lot of trouble. There was a new vacuum cleaner salesman who knocked on the door of the first house on the street. And a lady answered the door, a real tall lady, and before she could even say a word, the enthusiastic salesman barged into the living room, opened a big black plastic bag, and poured all the cow droppings all over the carpet. <laughs> Madam, if I cannot clean this up with the use of this new powerful vacuum cleaner, I will eat it. The lady said, Do you, would you like chili sauce or ketchup with that? <laughs> and the bewildered salesman said, well, why, madam? She said, because there's no electricity in this house. Oh my. So you see, sometimes just emotion can get you in trouble. That's why I tell people all the time, let emotions subside and then decide. Some advice I could take myself a little more often, sometimes. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. As I told you, I didn't have the most holy two weeks in my life the last two weeks. But God is still good. Thank God for his mercy. Now, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. We're going to learn a big lesson right here. When your get up and go has got up and gone, you just need to get up and get it back. This is not a complicated message today. I'm just saying stir yourself up in the Holy Ghost. Stop waiting for somebody else to come along and do it. Motivate yourself. Stir yourself up. Whatever may be your task, whatever may be your task, if you're on the platform or cleaning the toilets, whatever may be your task, work at it heartily, not hardly, Just to make sure we're not, you know, Paul said, I buffet my body, but a lot of Christians think he said, I buffet my body. <laughs> Work at it heartily from the soul as something done for the Lord and not for men. You know, one of the things that keeps me motivated is because I keep in front of me that I'm doing what I'm doing for God. That it's the call on my life and that I want to be able to stand on that last day and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to be able to say, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. I want to be a finisher in life. Not just a starter who started out with fire and somewhere along the way got turned into cold ashes. Let me ask you, how many of you have a fireplace? The fireplace looks the best when it's full of a raging fire. Nothing exciting about cold ashes. What 
whatsoever you do, work at it heartily from the soul. Now let's look at verse 24. Knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord and not from men that you will receive the inheritance which is your real reward. The one whom you are actually serving is the Lord Christ, the Messiah. Now, here's one of the places where I think we get in trouble. And we just don't even see this, but once you see it, you're going to get it. When I go to work and I work hard to get some kind of uh, attention from my boss and I don't get it, now I'm all discouraged and I lose my zeal. But it's because I'm, my motive is wrong. Everything we do in life, we need to do it unto the Lord. If you're raising kids, you raise them for the Lord. If you're in a difficult marriage and you feel like you're supposed to stay there, then you do it unto the Lord. You say, God, I'm doing this for you. And let me tell you something. If we stop doing things to get people to notice us, and we stop doing things to get a worldly reward, then we're going to step into the area where we can get the reward that God has waiting for us, but we'll never get until we start living our life for Him and not for people. Amen. Everything you do, even when you get dressed in the morning, do it for the Lord. I want to represent you well today, Lord. Learn how to carry on a continual conversation with God. That's what intimacy means. God cares about everything that concerns you. There's nothing that you can't tell Him. He wants to hear everything that you're thinking. You can have that kind of relationship with Him. Stop looking to people to give you what only God can give you. We talked about this a little bit last night when I said stop looking to somebody else to make you happy. Stop looking at somebody else to make you feel good about yourself. Only God can do that. Know who you are in Christ and then you'll be able to handle any kind of rejection that you get from the world. Did you hear me? When you know who you are in Christ, you can get over insecurity and, and extreme shyness that cripples you because once you know who you are in Christ, you don't pay that much attention to what other people think of you. Amen. Care more about your reputation in heaven than you care about your reputation on earth. I want to be well known there. Another thing I want to tell you, and it goes back to what we saw in uh, about David, where he said, Why so downcast all my soul? Put your hope in God. Expect God to do something. This is another thing that I've been talking about a lot for the last two months. Start to expect some great things to happen on purpose. The Bible tells us to put our expectations in God. Expect God. We get into trouble when we're expecting people. Well, I expected you to do this. Well, I expected you to do that. Well, I expected you to act better than this. Well, I expected you to change. <laughs> we need to put our expectations in God. And we need to pray more, I think. I think we try to do too many things on our own. We wait until we've done everything else, and then we pray. Let's be a people that pray immediately. Cover everything with prayer. Pray everywhere on every occasion in the Spirit with all manner of prayer. Because let me tell you something. One, one sentence of a whisper of a prayer to God can get more done in just a few moments than we can get in a lifetime of struggle. God answers prayer. He does. A lot of times He answers prayer and we don't even see it. Psalm 27, 13, and 14. I love these scriptures. I share them often, but they're so full of hope. Let's take a look at them. Psalm 27, 13, and 14. What, what would have become of me? I, I, I can just see it's like, what, 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 what would have become of me? Had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? Everybody say, something good is going to happen in my life. Something good is going to happen to me. And something good is going to happen through me. 
It's not just to me, it's to me and through me. I said this morning, I'm expecting good news today. I'm expecting to go over there and have a good meeting. I don't wait to see until I get here how things are going to be. I mean, yes, in reality, we all have to kind of see what the outcome is. But, you know, expecting nothing gets you nothing. I'd rather expect a lot and get half of it than to expect a little and get all of it. What are you expecting? Do you have any aggressive expectation in your life? I taught this at a chapel at the office, and I got a report the next day that one woman said, man, that really works. <laughs> she, she has a son that just really gives her a lot of trouble, a teenage son, and they're just always at each other, and she just, she said, I've gotten to the point where I just dread to go home. But she said, that night when I was driving home and I started to dread it, I decided to try your message. So I drove home saying, I'm expecting my son to be in a good mood tonight. I'm expecting good things. And she said, she went in the house that night, she was there a little bit, and her son came over and said, Mom, I just want you to know that I love you. Now, I can't give you an ironclad guarantee that you're always going to get results that quick, but you can't help yourself if you're expecting bad things, and you can't help yourself if you're expecting nothing. But you might help yourself. If there's any chance that we can help ourselves, why not do it? You might help yourself if you, every day, this is not a one-time thing because you're at the conference this weekend and I'm preaching on it. This is an everyday thing. Farm a habit every morning early. I am expecting something good to happen in my life today. I'm expecting something good for my children. I'm expecting something good for my friends, my husband. I'm expecting something good through me. I'm expecting good news. And I've still got people sitting there going. <laughs> I mean, at least. <laughs> See, we need to get excited. We need to be enthusiastic. And some people say, well, I'm not used to that in church. Well, get used to it! A little bit of noise is not going to scare God. There's nothing wrong with being quiet either, but we need to be more enthusiastic. Well, I just wish that I felt that way. You're missing the whole entire message. Let me tell you something. If you don't remember anything else I said today, remember this. Your feelings will follow your decisions. Did you hear me? Your feelings will follow your decisions. You don't see how you feel and then decide. You decide because you own your feelings. You decide what you're going to do and your feelings can catch up or not catch up, but I'm going to do it whether I feel like doing it or not. I don't know if you have any idea how valuable what I just said is and what a trap so many people are trapped in in what I feel. What is, I, wish I, I wish I felt excited like you. I told you when I got up this morning, I walked sideways for five minutes. And if you want to know the absolute truth, I've got a groin muscle that's pulled and every step I take up here hurts. Yeah, oh... Well, I didn't consider staying home. It's not an option. Now am I going to sit around all day? Oh, 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 oh. I'm going, Ray. You can go with me or stay home, but I'm going. You know, that's just not my personality. You know what? It ain't mine either. 
I mean, I lived in the pity party, the depression pit. You know, I was always in some kind of pit. Has anybody here heard, heard about the donkey that fell in the pit? Anybody never heard of the donkey that fell in the pit? Oh, well, there's enough to tell it again. Because I feel like telling it anyway. Farmer's donkey fell in the pit. The farmer looked down and thought it's going to be hard to get him out of there. He's old. I think I'll just leave him in there. Called some neighbors and said, I need you to help me bury this donkey. So they started shoveling dirt on the donkey. Everybody shoveling dirt on the donkey. You ever feel like a donkey? Everybody shoveling dirt on you? Their plan, like the devil's plan, was to bury that donkey. The donkey stood there and cried piteously in the beginning. <laughs> How would they sound? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing a good donkey today, but... Anyway, I bet it sounded really bad. Um, after quite a while, I found out that wasn't doing any good. Come on, there's a message. Oh, everybody's shoveling dirt on me. <laughs> That's not going to stop them. He tried a new plan. They'd throw in a shovel of dirt and he'd shake it off and step up on top of it. They'd shovel in some more dirt and he'd shake it off and get up on top of it. They'd shovel a little dirt and he'd shake it off and get up on top of it. Pretty soon he just walked right out of that pit. Well, you say, sister, my get up and go is just got up and gone. Well, how about if you get up and get it back? You say, well, what can I expect? Well, if you're in a relationship with people who need to change, expect it to happen. The most devastating, that you can, devastating thing that you can do to a relationship is look at somebody and think, you are never going to change. Got you, didn't I? Expect more opportunities, expect open doors, expect favor, expect promotion. Expect to hear from God, expect to be led by the Spirit. Thank you Lord for the word today, we appreciate it so much and just pray that you'll help us today get the, the real message that you have here in Jesus' name. Has your get up and go got up and gone. <laughs> no matter who you are, no matter what you're doing in life, no matter what your occupation is, your station in life, there will be times when you get tired of doing it. See, we all think, well, if I could just do that, <laughs> well, if I could just do that, well, if I could just live here, but I'm telling you the truth, I don't care what you do. There are going to be times when you get tired of doing it. The only people who succeed in life are those who can do what they know they should be doing without emotion to motivate them. Now, did you hear me? The only people in life who can succeed are those who can do what they know they need to do without emotion motivating them. You know, moms get tired of taking care of kids. It's not that you didn't want them, but you get tired of taking care of them. You get tired of cleaning house. You get tired of cooking. The kids get tired of going to school. They get tired of being kids, you know. Kids want to make more decisions. Adults want to be, have a day or two where they can make no decisions. I get tired of doing what I do at times. I love it, but to be honest, you know, I get tired of traveling sometimes. I get tired of always being in charge of something. 
You know, I don't get to sit out there and just look at somebody doing what I'm doing. You know, I was, I was thinking about you guys when you were worshiping. I saw one woman, she was just into it. And See, I'm into it, but i got to also be thinking about what I'm going to say when I come up here and open my mouth. And uh, to be honest, we always think we want more of something, but the thing that people don't see is the more you have of anything, the more responsibility that you also have. And people don't realize when they're asking for things that they're not just going to get the fun part, they're also going to get the work part, the responsibility part. You get a bigger house, you're going to have more to clean. Amen? Sometimes I get tired of asking people for their money all the time. But you have not because you ask not, so this is part of what I need to do if I want to help people all over the world then I have to keep encouraging people to help me help those people. People in the public, I want to be normal. And normal people want to be recognized and well known. So my point is, is that no matter what your station in life is and no matter what you're doing, please believe me today when I tell you that doing something else is not going to make you any happier long term than you are right now. Now, yes, you know, if you got your dream job, that might make you happier for a little while than what you are right now, but you will get tired of doing it. I mean, there are people who just think they've died and gone to heaven when they come to work at our ministry. It's like, <laughs> and you know what? After about a month, they find out it's a job, just like any other job that we don't float around on a cloud all day and sing the hallelujah chorus. They work for Joyce Meyer, but they never see me. You see me more on TV than most of them, them do. And we expect them to get to work on time. We expect them to work hard. We have different guidelines at the office. And so after all, it just turns out to be a job. A good job, but still just a job that you can get just as tired of. How many of you ever get tired of doing what you're doing? <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Only Mike and Dave didn't raise their hand. Uh, Dave, do you ever get tired of doing what you're doing? He, he really doesn't. He's just like, I, I'm, I think Dave's from another planet, and I just haven't figured out which one yet, but that's all right. All, all the emotion he doesn't have, I've got it for both of us. When the get up and go has got up and gone, you need to get up and get it back. You can't sit around and just, well, I wish I felt better. Or even worse, expecting somebody else to come along and make you feel better. God has given us a free will. We don't have to be the victim of just every feeling and weird emotion that comes down the path at us. We can make decisions about how we're going to live. And we can get up and live the way that God wants us to live by His grace and by His mercy. Clearly, let me say that we do nothing without God. But at the same time, anything that God has asked us to do, He is ready to help us do it. Anything that God has asked us to do. So yes, I do need grace to do what I'm doing, but there's another side of it, which is I already have that grace because God would not ask me to do it and not equip me to do it. Anything that God has asked you to do in your life, you are equipped to do it. So stop saying, this is too much for me, I just can't handle this. I said, stop saying, this is just too much for me, I can't handle this. I said, stop saying... <laughs> Nothing dead praises God. <laughs> Psalm 115, 17. I want you to see that this is actually in the Bible. Psalm 115, verse 17. I love this scripture. It says a lot. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any who go down into silence. So, we're going to talk for a few minutes about some dead things and learning how to discern when something is dead and when it's full of life. What about continuing to do things that God got finished with a long time ago. <laughs> you know, there's a kind of a rule of thumb. If the horse has been dead 10 years, it's time to dismount. 
God's always moving, he's flowing, and you know, sometimes something is perfectly right for this time frame in your life, but now just out of habit or whatever, sometimes we don't even know why, you know, we're still trying to do the same thing another 10 years down the road, and it's just, it's dead, it's new, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't understand what's wrong. Well, maybe God got finished with it a long time ago, and you're not finished with it yet. Maybe God's trying to do a new thing. I tell a story sometimes, and this is actually a true story, about a, uh, a guard at a castle that stood in this one spot, 24 hours around the clock, they had a guard that stood there guarding what? Nobody knew. So somebody got curious enough to check into, what is this guy doing here? Well, as they checked back far enough into history, at one time, one of the queens had planted a rose bush there. And she didn't want it to get trampled until it got well rooted, so she put a guard there to guard it. Now, like a hundred years later, a guard is standing there round the clock guarding nothing simply because that was what they had always done. I don't care how long you've been doing it, if it doesn't have life in it, you need to learn to know when you're touching death and when you're touching life. Amen? Because nothing dead praises God. Our dead works don't praise God. The Bible talks a lot about dead works. What's a dead work? It's a work that's not working. It's me trying to do God's job. It's me making my plan, expecting God to bless it. He's the author and the finisher. And if he doesn't author a thing, he has no obligation to ever finish it. You start it, you finish it. Amen? And last night when we were having true confession, I told you that one of my sins in the last two weeks was starting this big thing, getting a bunch of people involved, and then realizing that I didn't have peace, and then I realized I never asked God about it. Acknowledge God in all your ways, and he will direct your path. And sometimes God, it may be okay, something that we're doing, but God gets a little insulted when we leave him out. One well, of the wisest things to do is to just consider God, to consult him. Is this the way that you want me to go? Now, depression is a type of deadness. I think we can all say that. Anybody here who's ever been depressed for even a half a day, you know that there's no worse feeling. You have no desire to do anything. Thoughts are dark and negative. And you know, when David was depressed, the psalmist David, King David, when he was depressed... He didn't just lay there and be depressed. Let's look at Psalm 42 and 43 and just see some of the action that David took. Now let me just preempt what I'm going to say about depression by saying this. I know that many people suffer from depression. I'm not at all being insensitive. If it's something medical that you cannot help, then keep looking for the help that you need until you get it. But almost everything that I read on the subject says that even if depression is caused from something in your body or something medical, you still have to fight it on several levels. And so maybe you can't do anything about the medical part, but a lot of people's depression really has nothing to do with something wrong with them. It's the way they're thinking. Come on, does anybody know you can think yourself right into a fit? It's the way they talk. It's their outlook on life. It's not being grateful. It's not being thankful. But largely, it's just by having your mind on the wrong stuff. And that's what David talks about here. Psalm 42, 5. I love the way he talks to his own soul. Why are you cast down, O my inner self? And why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him. For I shall yet praise him, my help and my God. Now, if you read the first part of this, David remembers, like, 
Look at verse, verse 3, Psalm 42, 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? So he was apparently going through a really rough time, and even people are taunting him, saying, well, where is your God? These things I earnestly remember. I love his response. These things I earnestly remember and pour myself out within me, how I went slowly before the throng and led them in procession to the house of God, like a bandmaster before, and so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but there was a time when he was bringing the ark of God into the city, and they threw such an outrageous party, and David got so unbelievably happy that he stripped down to a loincloth and danced in the streets. And he said, I'm crying, but here's what I'm going to think about. Come on now. See, you can think about anything you want to think about. You don't have to think about every bad thing that's ever happened to you in your life. You don't have to just think about all your problems all day long. You can choose to remember some good things in your life. And so can I. You know, when I'm feeling a little bit off in the morning, and that's usually when you can tell things are about to go the wrong way. When I'm feeling a little bit off in the morning, one of the things that, well, there's a couple things I'm going to share with you today, but one of the things that I've found that really, really helps me is just to get thankful on purpose. I have a mission this year, so you're going to hear me say this over and over and over and over and over and over and over, but that's the way we get it. I really want to get people to understand that they can't be passive and a passive person wants something good to happen and they're just going to sit there and wait to see if it does. But that we must be purposeful people. We must be people who live on purpose. And by that I mean we decide what we're going to do and we get up and do it. Amen. We don't wait to have to feel like it or to think it's a good idea or to have a whole bunch of people clapping and cheering for us. Just because my get up and go has got up and gone, that doesn't mean that I have to lay down with it. I have greater power than how I feel. I can actually say, I am going to get up off of this couch and I am going to do something with my life. You know, there's a law of activity that I heard recently, and this is simple, but I love it. The more you do, the more you're able to do. The less you do, the less you're able to do. And if you want to get old quick, just go retire at 65 and go sit in a chair and see what happens to you. People ask me all the time, are you thinking about retirement? No! No! I'm thinking about refirement, not retirement. I feel better than most of you do at 30 and 40. And a lot of it has to do with attitude. And a lot of it has to do with the fact, yes, that, you know, we try to take care of ourselves. But even more than that, it's the way we think and our outlook on life and putting ourselves into something that's bearing good fruit. You sit or you hang out with dead stuff all the time and it's going to get off on you. You even got to get away from some of these dead people you're hanging out with all the time that have nothing but some sad story to tell you all the time and don't want to do anything but talk about how bad everything is out in society and how miserable they are. Hello? <sighs> that felt good. <laughs> nothing dead praises God. Amen? Not a dead attitude. Nothing. Psalm 42. Verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my inner self? And why should you moan over me and be disquieted within me? Now hang on to this. Hope in God. You're gonna, I'm going to tell you something a little bit later about hope. And watch this. And wait expectantly. Woo, I love that. I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about expectancy. Some of you need to get your expectors out of the back of the closet, dust them off, and get them activated again. Because you've gotten into a habit of just sitting around, I don't know what's going to happen, I guess we just wait and see. Well, I can prophesy, nothing. <laughs> nothing. God said to Jeremiah, what do you see? 
Amen? After Abram had lost everything, God took him up, told him to climb a mountain, and he got him up there and said, what do you see? And so, I don't want to talk about what you've lost today. It's not that I don't care, but that's not what this is about. I don't want to think about what I've lost. I don't want to think about the fact that I lost my childhood and I was abused by my parents. And, you know, now, you know, there's nobody left but me. And I have, I have no good memories from that. But you know what? I'm going to talk about what I do have. I'm going to think about what I do have and all the benefits and the, the good things that God has done for me. Amen? Please take what I'm getting ready to say, okay. <laughs> Some of you have sung the same old song for so long that people are so tired of hearing it. <laughs> what do you think the Bible means when it says, sing unto the Lord a new song? That's not just making up some, I love you, Lord. That means just get something coming out of your mouth besides the same old thing all the time. Poor me, what about me? I've had a bad deal in life. You know, I didn't get a good start. My parents didn't love me. My parents didn't love me either. They didn't know how to. They were all messed up, dysfunctional. I survived. I'm still here. I raised four brilliant children. I'm helping people all over the world. It's our attitude. It's the way we look at what's happening to us. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God and wait expectantly for Him. You wake up in a bad mood? Change it. I'm in a bad mood. Well, most of the world is about two minutes after they get up. I don't know what my deal was this morning, but I woke up, and I am telling you the truth, for five minutes I was walking to the left. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I told Dave, I said, I feel like, and I kept, I'd walk in a straight line, and then I'd find myself going this way, and I thought, what is this all about? But I didn't just go to bed and say, oh my gosh, I must have some kind of terrible to the left disease, I'm going to just... <laughs> <laughs> it's called fight the good fight of faith and man you got to fight for yourself sometimes your moods belong to you don't just give them to the devil and then again in Psalm 43 he says the same thing I'm not going to go read it but why so downcast all my soul put your hope in God now you know the interesting thing is sometimes you got to talk to yourself more than once A little self-examination helps. What is my problem? <laughs> what is the root of my problem? When you're in a stinky mood, don't just look out here at everything. Well, you, well, you, you. My boss and my job and my house and my bank account. How about a little self-examination? What is my problem? Not being thankful. Not looking at what I do have. Yeah, last week I had to spend a couple days in the hospital, not for me, but being with somebody that was sick. And, you know, I, I didn't really want to be there. I mean, I wanted to bless them, but, I, you know, that was supposed to have been my day off. But you know how I got over it? I thought, man, thank God I'm not the one in the bed. How many of you would rather be visiting somebody in the hospital than be the one in the hospital? How many would rather visit somebody in jail than be the one in jail? Woo, hallelujah. And I'm telling you what, the way the world is today, it can just vacuum all the joy right out of you and it only takes a few minutes. That's why you got to fight to keep a good attitude and to, to be thankful and appreciative and some mornings I make a list of things to be thankful for if I got a real bad case I don't just try to thank get out my I'm like, I'm thankful for <laughs> 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 you 
You know, there may be a few people who just wake up happy and they're that way every day of their life. I'm kind of married to one of those, but I'm not one of those. <laughs> Dave wakes up every morning, oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day, and I'm like... Let me get my caffeine level up before you make any noise. You know, David felt, now listen to me, David felt down, down, down. But here's what I love. He was spiritually active. See, no matter how I feel in my soul, there's a deeper part of me that I can activate by faith, and that's my spirit. And with our spirit, we can fight all this nonsense that comes against our soul. And you will win if you will get up and do the part that God is asking you to do. You got to be a fighter in life. It's really easy to give up. You don't need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to give up.
is down, what's left is right Chasing stars and holding view I can't see the end, but we'll see it through Keep the sky on your mind 